evening. Welcome back to the Wednesday Night Photo Show. Thanks again for joining us. Um, this is our little semi-weekly meet and greet and chat about photography session, and we really appreciate everybody making a little time to join us on a Wednesday night. Um, as always, as we're going through stuff tonight, if you guys have questions, comments, anything that you'd like to throw in, leave a comment. On Facebook, YouTube, just throw a comment in the chat and uh, we'll throw it up on the screen. And uh, if you've got questions, we will answer them for you live on the show. So this week, the leaves are changing. The leaves are starting to change. The weather certainly changed this week. And it kind of seems like we're getting into that time of year. Where we're going to start to see some fall color. And uh, so my name is Scott. And tonight we've got Phil with us here. And uh, Phil, I know you've done a ton of this kind of stuff. Hi, and, folks. Uh, I want to spend a little time talking about getting some great pictures of the fall colors. Uh, yeah, so, so how are we doing over here? Um, I guess I, we kind of start with like, what are we looking for? I'm starting to see the leaves just starting to change around here in Allentown. That sounds yes. about right. It is. It's going to be a little bit of time before it's at peak in Allentown, uh, north of here in Pennsylvania, things are really developing. Um, and then even further north, uh, a little bit, there's, you know, there's some stuff going on there too. Of mm -hmm. course, a lot of folks travel all the way up to New England and other places to leaf peep, as they say. Oh, yeah, for sure. And um, there's lots of great places in Pennsylvania, lots of great places in the area, and lots of areas in several hours away. So it all varies as to when all the right. peak is going to be. So let's take a look. I know you threw together a little information for us. We've got your schedule up here. Yeah. And keep in mind, these are estimates. This is going to change day by day. Uh, if people want to find out information about this themselves, if you do a search for something like um, leaf uh, fall foliage report 2021, something like that, you'll come up with a number of hits. And oh. uh, there's, yeah, there's some maps. Ask, like what kind of resources you're pulling from here when you're looking for what those dates are going to be? Yeah, what, one of the ones that's very popular is one out of the Smoky Mountains. You'll see that as part of the, the description on the page. Mm -hmm. And uh, they kind of have a little slider. It's kind of cool. You can progress through the month or the weeks and kind of see on the map where you're planning on shooting, what wow. the expected peak is going to be. So it's really cool that way. Oh, that is really cool. Yeah. So the, some of this information is pulled from that and other areas. And as you can see, if you look at the bottom there, Lehigh Valley, uh, Northampton, Berks, and Schuylkill here in Pennsylvania, probably over the course of from the 18th to the 25th is the best estimate we have right now for expected peak. Mm -hmm. That can change from a couple of variables, which we'll talk about in a moment. But then in Elk and Cameron and Clearfield and Clinton counties, mm -hmm. A lot of great opportunities for fall foliage, a lot of vistas from which to shoot from up on high out that mm -hmm. way uh, from the 12th through the 18th is probably the expected peak range. And then just a few other counties uh, up north uh, between here and there, Luzerne, Carbon, Monroe County out in the Poconos, Pike, Potter, Tioga, and so forth. These are probably anytime from, from a few days from now up until maybe the 14th or the 15th. Now, that doesn't mean you can't go out now and find some stuff to shoot. And it doesn't mm -hmm. mean maybe after that you won't have some opportunities too. So right, amongst the things like that peak. Yeah. But amongst yeah. the things that can change that, if we get a considerable amount of rain, for instance, at any time, once those leaves are kind of loose and they're starting to fall, you know, that could lower some opportunities. So mm -hmm. we always recommend people get out as early as possible to get the kinds of things you can shoot before it's even at peak, right? Because when some colors gotcha. change, you can get some close-up shots or some telephoto shots of maybe just one small area. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's lots of opportunities, I would say, just as the color starts to change, all the way right through peak. Yeah, I was just here and I saw something in the weather report about how slightly warmer temperatures and rain this week might actually delay the color a little bit. Could do it. Mm -hmm. hmm. the crisp nights are, you know, are something that sometimes really help it, but... okay. Yeah, the weather can change, the rain can can affect things. So, just estimates at this point, and things right, can right. change as so uh, as just as variable more. as the weather. Yeah, yeah, kind of. <laughs> All right, so we've got a ton of great photos that we've got in here. Yeah, some of these, uh, a lot of these are mine. Some of them are my colleagues. When I, and I'll mention uh, actually some of yours as well, Scott. And you may have some others you want to pull up, and we'll mention those when we come to them. One of the things that we like to talk about when it comes to 
opportunities for the early part of the peak or before things really get in full color. Mm -hmm. um, our macro opportunities are close ups, right? You sometimes you might have some leaves changing. This is just one example of that. More importantly, a lot of the questions we get is related to the lighting when it comes to fall foliage. So you might be in a situation where it's an overcast day and you say, is that a good time or a bad time to go out? Actually, it can be very good because you've got a lot of that even light, right? Uh, in the same way that uh, an overcast or a bright overcast is very helpful for waterfall photography, not a lot of harsh shadows. In the same way, we can pull out a lot of color in our photography when we have that overcast. So this is just mm -hmm. one example of an opportunity. You certainly don't want to include the sky in all of your pictures. That doesn't usually make for a good fall foliage, although there are exceptions for that. And uh, this is just one shot. If you go to the next one, we'll give you another example of what the kind of thing that you the, can... uh, like the texture that you've got going on here as well. The, the lichen on the rock, it looks like. Yeah, the this was an opportunity just as found that way. You know, it mm -hmm. would have been just as easy to place the leaf there. But it, the combination of the green against the red, you know, those two colors work real yeah, well together they're... and it seems to pop that way. And then you've got the yellow. So not your typical what some people would call a fall foliage shot. But mm -hmm. if you look at all different angles, you're going to find this kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is one of your shots, Scott. Yeah. yeah, so this was one of mine, and this was that same kind of, like, this is my deal, right? Like, I have my little camera with me when I go out for walks at lunch, and so this is about two blocks away from Dan's Camera City, and what caught my eye about this one was this one bright leaf, and this is, like, the other end of what you were talking about, where you talk about, like, very early in the season, you can find that, okay, there's a couple of leaves, and you can find a composition like that. Mm -hmm. This was kind of at the tail end, and so I, that's kind of how I framed this up. I saw this one leaf here and then just include the bear tree in the background like it's the last remaining leaf of yeah. the season. I like I like the 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 story that this tells and the other thing I like about this because the overall scene has a nice mood that's got a fall mood to it to me anyway. The inclusion of the gray sky here is one of those exceptions where it's part of the story, right? This is towards the end of the season, things are getting cooler, a lot of the leaves are falling, but yet we still have these opportunities of really brilliant color if we look and then when you take a picture like this and you you isolate that in the foreground that really uh that really brings out the color for it so it's a neat little story which i think is a good lesson in when you're doing compositions and you're trying to find something different like we've all seen a lot of fall foliage pictures right so mm -hmm. when you're trying to do something different if you include a middle uh foreground a middle and a background and better yet, if it can tell a story like this, it makes it a little more interesting. Yeah, one of the things we talk about in some of our classes in that regard with when you're talking about storytelling is this idea of juxtaposition, placing one thing against another mm -hmm. to kind of tie that narrative together. Yeah, and the, uh, the, the, the apparent life of the leaf, it's still got some texture to it and color and so forth compared to the bare tree that uh, there's certainly that juxtaposition. Nice. So what's going on here? This is another shot of uh, a, a fairly overcast day, and mm -hmm. it's a little bit misty, so you can kind of make some of that out in the in the trees yeah. in the background. It's a great atmosphere. Yeah, it's also, thanks, it's also a good example of not using a wide angle for everything for fall foliage. Oh, yeah. Okay. Sometimes mm -hmm. a telephoto lens, and we'll talk a little in a little while about lenses and, and gear and stuff, but... This is an example about using a zoom lens to, there's a lot of water between me and where those trees are, of just using that zoom lens to isolate that, find the things that are interesting on the other shore, and keep out the gray skies. Mm -hmm. right? We don't have to see those. We don't have to be distracted by a white or a grayish sky. And that's where a zoom lens can, can really come in handy. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. This is one of, speaking uh, of overcast skies. Yeah, speaking of overcast, beautiful overcast sky. This is one of our colleagues' pictures, uh, one of Steve, uh, Steve Miller's photos. Mm -hmm. And talk about your foreground, middle ground, and background, right? I think he's yeah. really nailed that. <clears throat> We've got a lot to look at here. And that's the kind of thing when you do when you do include a foreground, middle ground, and background that your eye wants to linger, right? There's not just color here, there's texture. Um, there's the framing device of the trees on the left-hand side. So 
I think it's mm -hmm. a good example of a, of a pretty dynamic composition. And he's also got the fantastic um, feature of all of that color in the sky and then the reflection of that. Reflection, right. Yeah. right. So, and then the like sort of dots of color in the in the tree line in the background. <clears throat> Sure. And, and if you think about it, yes, it's fall foliage, but <clears throat> it's almost a minor character in this, right? Mm -hmm. It's just as important in terms of framing the picture, the, the foliage, as all of that beautiful color in the sky and the reflection and so forth. So you're, uh, the color doesn't always have to be the subject, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes if you just shoot a bunch of trees and a bunch of color, it's hard to it's hard to imagine what the what the main subject is other than cool colors. This is a little bit different approach, and I think it's really nice that way. Yeah, it's a really successful image. Yeah. Here is a, a different example, different kind of lighting. When you're dealing with um, front lighting, we'll call it, mm -hmm. or when you've got the light is not necessarily a noonday light, but neither is it extremely low in the sky. So you don't have okay. really warm colors just yet, but um, this is an example of, of what you can get for something like that. Now notice the sky, you'll see in a moment a different kind of sky. As much as we love blue skies when we get up and go out for walks and things, not always the best for photographs because it just doesn't add a lot of character. Right, so, right, it's just a big flat blue thing. Yeah, so you'll notice yeah. that this is uh, somewhat of a panoramic kind of crop. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really a panoramic picture of, of images that were stitched together, but with the lens that was on the camera at the time, a lot of what you're seeing here is either a murky reflection because there, you see the mist in the water, mm -hmm. which wasn't terribly exciting to see, or you're seeing just a blank blue sky. So it just makes more sense sometime to do some cropping afterwards to isolate the color if that's what you're trying to get across. If it's a blank blue sky, it's only going to capture the attention of the viewer for a, a, sh a relatively short period of time. Right. Gotcha. So if, with the mist on the water here, what kind of time of day are we talking about? This is morning, but not early, early morning. You know, it's a little okay. bit later on. Um, you don't have those really low, extremely warm rays kind of side lighting that you'll see in a moment hitting everything. But it, it's early enough that the mist hasn't burned off yet. Mm -hmm. And we usually get questions about that. And we, when we talk later about techniques and so forth, some people might be interested. But when you have a lot of mist, that's usually something where you have to overexpose in order to get it properly. Here, there was just a little bit of it, so it didn't, it didn't matter so much. The metering in the camera pretty much handled this fairly well on an automatic metering. All right, so let's contrast that to this other sky that you've got. Yeah. Similar image in terms of the, the um, aspect ratio, but this one actually is about seven, seven or eight images that are stitched together. So this is a true panoramic in that sense. And you've got a little more character there with the fluffy clouds, right? Mm -hmm. If that was just blue, it'd be okay, but it adds some interest as a lot of people are looking for. And then if you hearken back to Steve's image earlier, with all of that color in the sky. You know, clouds aren't always a bad thing. Stormy weather right. is a photographer's friend in a way. Either oh, yeah. just after a storm, right? Or <laughs> or just before a storm is when some of those skies are really interesting. We don't yeah. quite have a storm here, but at least we have uh, some interest in the sky beyond the blue. Yeah, and then that shows up as a reflection in the water and adds texture to the foreground as well. Yeah. So that was stitched after the fact, but a lot of people can stitch things in camera or in their phones these days. Oh, yeah. Yep. Switch over to that panorama mode and just yeah, get yourself a panorama. So we're into a different kind of lighting here. The angle it is a very different angle. Yeah. The <laughs> angle where Steve is at here. This is another one of Steve's fantastic images. You can see by the shadows that the, the light is coming from his right side. Right. Mm -hmm. So okay. the, the sun is fairly low in the sky. And it's either early enough in the day or late enough in the day that you've got a really warm uh, feeling, that golden hour kind of feeling to the, the quality of the light on, on the scene. Mm -hmm. And then it also offers an opportunity for a reflection. And yeah. you know, from, from a compositional standpoint, the way that the water is going, not in a straight across the scene kind of way, but in a diagonal is another dynamic part to the composition here. Then mm -hmm. you've got the trees at the top 
going back in perspective. So we've got some diagonals, which is a lot more interesting to the eye sometimes than everything perfectly straight and horizontal and vertical. So another, I think, a nice composition with a lot of good color and some foreground, middle ground, and background. Yeah, and I love the way that when the light, when the sun is that low on the horizon, you get that warmer colored light and the warm light hitting the warm colored leaves. They just light up. Yeah. And that contrast against the blue sky is spectacular. And, and when you think of foliage, it really is a time to take advantage of that early part of the day and that latter part of the day. Because the tree, the, the leaves, especially some of the yellow leaves, will transmit that light through them. They're so translucent. Mm -hmm. That's when things get really start to get interesting and you get that real glow to things when you've got that side lighting. So it is a time to get up early for sure if you want to get some good fall foliage usually. You've got to be sure and think about where you're going to be and if there's a mountain that's going to be blocking the early daylight, right? Mm -hmm. So when we when we have people thinking about where, where they're going to go and when they're going to go photographing fall foliage, do some research ahead of time. Know the angles that the sun is going to be at and if you can get those early morning rays. Oh, for sure. I know we, we go up to Jim Thorpe. It's spectacular in the fall. You're kind of down mm -hmm. there. You're in the valley and it's just walls of foliage up every angle, but you're down in the valley. That's right. <laughs> That's Sunset right. isn't until sunrise. Sunrise isn't until like nine o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And and you may not see all of that rich light on the on right. the tree on the color until a little bit later. Yeah. These Here's another good. side lit. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Picture of sorts. This is one of Jack's here from from Dan's Camera City. This is one of his images that he offered up to me. And another another idea of you know when we talk about fall color let's let's put it that way instead of fall foliage right there's mm -hmm. lots of things that are colorful and gourds uh gorgeous shot as jack told me when he handed this off to me <laughs> pun intended um or another thing that we see a lot in the fall and look at the color it's fantastic yeah we can tell it's side lit by the ones the uh, by the parts of it that are a little bit brighter and you can see a little shadow coming from some of the other pieces mm -hmm. so you got a little bit of glowing light from the side light but then he also took advantage of a lot of this is in shade, if you will. So it's a yeah. more even light throughout, kind of what that bright overcast gives you. So mm -hmm. it's a little easier for the camera to not blow out the highlights and not lose detail in the shadows. Yeah. And the way that light rakes across brings out all that little texture. Yep. Works quite nicely. This uh, has got to be Steve's. <laughs> What's that? This has got to be Steve's. It's Steve's. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly right. And a fabulous shot at that. And there are a lot of hints at the side lighting here. When you look at the foreground, how he has um, given you some detail in the foreground, that kind of blur looking through some grasses. Yeah. Just this that's right. one hint. But when you look at the yellow tree above the animal, you can see the light coming from, as I'm looking at it, from the right hand side and in, in other parts of it. If you look at the uh, the animal's face, it's a little darker than what's behind him. So there's all these clues. We don't have any big harsh shadows, but there are clues that we have some beautiful side lighting. And we would mm -hmm. also imagine that this is either very late or very very late or early in the day, and that's yeah. why it's like that. So another reason to either get up early or stay late. Go follow Steve on Instagram if you want to see lots more photos of elk. Yeah, lots of elk photos like that. And thank you, Steve, for uh, for letting us use this one. It's it's really a another good example of fall color not being the only thing, right? That's yeah. not the subject. It's mm -hmm. it's part of a recipe of the rest of the composition. Yeah, and it sets the environment. It tells you about time of year. It yep. sets the whole scene. And and when people understand a little bit about light, they know that it's either an early morning or a late day, so it sets the time of day. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, it's a nice little, nice little story. So this one would be uh, an example of, I don't think so much of a side lighting as maybe um, you're starting to get into noonday, right? Or midday, okay. mm -hmm. the late, very late morning or the early afternoon. And a challenge with that, and you can see some of that in this image, which is why I wanted to use it is if you're not careful with your exposure and sometimes even if you are 
if you've got a lot of darks and a lot of brights, you've got a very dynamic scene in that regard with a lot of contrast. That harsher light of midday, more so than if you were had a forest of evergreens, perhaps, um, is going to affect the image and it can look a little washed out. And this okay. does a little bit. When you, when you think back to the just the previous image and how saturated those colors were because of those warm, um, softer rays of early morning, this is a much different feel than the one that we're, than, that we're moving to, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't say not to shoot in midday. If that's when you can get out, certainly get out and do it. Uh, you might want to look for uh, an isolated area that is maybe a little bit shaded. Um, okay. When we, when we talk about um, macro and close-up in a little bit, we talk about the gear, we talk about like diffusing the light in a scene. If you're in a little part of the forest where you have some nice color, but there's harsh light coming because it's midday, those are kind of things you can do. But on a wider angle or even on a telephoto shot like this, sometimes it can feel a little washed out. You right. want to try to underexpose a little bit to maybe help that, to mitigate that. Okay, just, yeah. You just do the best you can with it. Um, right, like you can let the dark in the water go much darker. That's right. That's right. You, okay, right. You may not get the quite the reflection that you wanted um, as if it was a more even light, but, you know, you work with what you have. Right. There's a little better contrast here. Yeah, a little better contrast, a little richer colors too, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah. But we can also see that the type of light that we're looking at isn't necessarily an extremely early daylight where things are um, hitting everything from the side. If you look at the wooden stumps in the water, in order mm -hmm. to keep the colors where they were, those are a little bright, right? So they're a little hot, as we say. There's not as mm -hmm. much detail as yeah. if we had a more overcast or a more balanced light on the scene. It would have been easier to keep everything at the right exposure, I guess would be the way to say it, but a little better than the first one. We're kind of getting somewhere. We're mm -hmm. underexposing a little bit to get those rich colors and that's helping us along. Yeah. It's got less of that washed out look to it. Yep. So what's your approach there? Are you just taking your exposure compensation and just turning it down a little bit to calm it yep. down? If you're working in like a program mode, not a full auto mode, but like a program mode or aperture priority, shutter priority, some of those that people are using or manual, whatever it is, you can um, either in, if you're in manual mode, uh, you can uh, change your shutter speed to uh, change the exposure. If you're working in one of the more automatic or semi-automatic modes that I was just describing, like aperture priority or something like that, you can use what's called exposure compensation to just knock it down a little bit, make things mm -hmm. a little bit darker, not a lot, because if you make things too dark and then in Photoshop or something afterwards, you're trying to lighten things up to bring out the color, you're going to get noise and you're not yeah. going to get that color that you think you're going to have. So you only want to underexpose a little bit. And sometimes it's like not sure. Maybe third of a stop, two thirds of a stop. Two thirds, probably. Yeah. yeah. Two thirds for sure. And uh, if you're not sure, Take a few, you know, either use the auto bracketing that the camera can do or mm -hmm. shoot one in the camera, what the camera meter says it should be, and then maybe go down a third of a stop, two thirds, maybe even one full stop, and then check them later in the computer and see which one works out best for you. Right. So here's another one that is um, fairly noonday light or midday-ish light. But mm -hmm. we're also seeing a fair amount of color here because, again, we underexposed a little bit to, okay. try to, yeah. to try to mitigate some of that, but not too much. Because if we underexposed too much, we wouldn't see as much color as we have. And this is an example of not, not a wide angle lens because this is from a very high angle and mm -hmm. on top of a ski slope area, actually. And this is a 200 millimeter zoom that's being used here. Okay. Because so if we had a wide angle, we, everything would be so tiny. You know, it would just right. be too small. You wouldn't make out the house, which is one of the focal points in it. You mm -hmm. wouldn't see the nice little ridge, ridge uh, top of the, the evergreens there. It kind of creates a nice little texture to it. So wide angle from a very far distance, not necessarily something you'd want to use. Right. So you're like way up on a mountain here shooting downward. Sh shooting downward. And instead of just finding the color, 
mm -hmm. using the house as a focal point. Yeah. You know, if you can imagine the house not there, it's still kind of interesting, but it does give the eye something to linger on other than, you know, a bunch of modeled, modeled color. Right, that's right. There. It's beautiful, but sometimes you need, you need a right, little bit of an anchor. Yeah. Right. So backlighting, uh, yeah. this, this is one of the most fun things. Uh, and this is one of your images too, Scott, mm -hmm. the, uh, I'll talk briefly about backlighting and I'll let you describe this one a little bit. What's nice about the leaves in the fall with the color, whether it's a, a reddish leaf here or a yellow one or an orange is when you can get backlighting glowing through there, boy, it just, it really grabs at the emotion. It, it, it's just a much more emotional thing than a flat light on things. So mm -hmm. this looks like this was all on the ground and you've got a real low angle here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Same kind of deal where I was just like, I have this tendency, like when I'm out taking pictures, like, okay, I can go out to Water Gap or something to take pictures. But a lot of times I'm just wandering around town and kind of finding fall foliage pictures and fall color just kind of at my feet. This is just on a sidewalk. Yeah. And it's, it's a smart thing to do. Special. Always be looking for pictures where you wouldn't necessarily look for them. You know, we walk past this stuff every day, as you always say, these are things we would normally walk past if we're not observant, we don't see them. So mm -hmm. when you see a little bit of contrast in your view, whether it's a few feet away or several feet away, when you see some contrast going on, some lighter and darker areas, that's when you should be snapping around and saying, hmm, let's inspect that a little bit more. Is that something interesting enough for a photograph? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it was, was this one leaf just catching the light and kind of lighting up from inside and saying, OK, what can I do with this? How can I make something out of this? Terrific. Yeah. So another example of not necessarily foliage again, but fallish kind of colors, right? We've got mm -hmm. the ambers and the oranges and yeah, the, that golden light, the golden light. And and we know it's backlit to some degree because we've got kind of like a rim lighting on the gra on the grasses. Mm -hmm. And this is another example of instead of just looking as color as as a the only motif, you've got the rhythm of all the lines kind of thing, maybe not like musical notes. But for me, it almost looks like a wave form, like a sound wave form, the way mm -hmm. they go from left to right to right. And just let your mind wander when you see a scene like this. And if it's enough to interest you to, to get the get the camera out and, and snap it, you know, do it and ask questions later. If, if something grabs you as this did mm -hmm. at the time when I saw it, I wasn't sure exactly what I all I liked about it, but I shot it. And then later on, I realized that eh, there's something there. It yeah. does set a fall kind of mood to it. And this looks like it's a bit of a longer lens again. It is. And this is from a little bit of a distance. Um, I don't remember how far away, but we're definitely using a zoom lens rather than a extreme wide angle lens to okay. give us just a portion of the scene in front of us. Mm -hmm. And it's a good, uh, it's a good lesson to no matter what your what kind of photography you're doing to play with different focal lengths to see what kind of what kind of isolation of the things in front of you you can get. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. It, it, I like the way it kind of flattens that out and just isolates the thing that we're looking at rather than the wide view, which would pull in a ton of stuff and shift mm -hmm. my perspective around. And, and what you can't see is there are some low bushes and things that are off to either side here that really didn't add anything. You know, if you think about it, you always want to be thinking about what subtract what doesn't help the scene. Right, right. right. Like these just, things aren't pulling their own weight in here. Get rid yeah. of them. You know, this yeah. was all about the lines and the rhythm and just the overall warm colors to it. So you just sometimes you just frame it to keep the strength of what you see as strengths in the image and only mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So I guess along those lines, what what's your typical walking around setup for if you're going to be out there? Like what's your lens choice look like and yeah. what else are you throwing in your camera bag? Well, I, I do think that it is good to have a variety. So when it, if you're looking at an inter interchangeable lens, can't, well, let's start with if, you're, if you've got, let's say, either a point and shoot or an enhanced point and shoot with a considerably long zoom, you're kind of mm -hmm. set, right? Because you've got a lot of different focal lengths with those. You can do extreme close-up macro stuff and you can do what I'll call a mid-range zoom like this one. And you can do even longer zooms. If there's just a part of a mountain that's far off on the distance, you can zoom out to just that. So 
if you've got a point and shoot or, a, or, or an enhanced point and shoot, you're kind of set in that regard. If it does take a filter in the front, because some of them do, a polarizing mm -hmm. filter is definitely something that we want because whether it's during the summertime, spring or fall, leaves, if even if you're not working around water, leaves will reflect a fair amount of light and you get a fair amount of glare and the polarizer will, you know, uh, temper some of that. But getting back to the lenses, if you do have an interchangeable lens camera, I certainly say don't leave the small, the wide angle in the bag or at home. Take that with you. Yeah. And by wide angle, you know, we're talking anything from 18 millimeters on um, an entry level DSLR type camera to maybe 24 millimeters on a full frame camera would be considered you know, relative wide angle. Mm -hmm. And then when we're talking about getting into zooms, Anything from beyond 70 up to maybe 200 is kind of a moderate zoom. A lot of people have all-in-one lenses like 18 to 200, or they maybe have one that goes um, just up to 200, but it's it's not totally wide angle. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I don't know about a big long zoom. I don't often take a really, really long zoom with me unless I'm planning and trying to get some birds or some wildlife. But uh, definitely a wide angle and a a moderate zoom would be the lenses that I'd have in the bag. And getting back to the polarizer, I have one here. I know a lot of folks know what these are, but the polarizers will allow you to mitigate some of those reflections and get better contrast on the, on the um, leaf foliage. But mm -hmm. then if you're working with water, you don't have to polarize it a lot or else you might lose some of the reflections in the water, but sometimes polarizing it a little bit will get you just enough of the glare cut down on the water and yet still get a nice reflection of the foliage in the water or the foliage. Oh, okay. So a polarizer yeah, so you get a choice is still of like, what that's going to look like. How much reflection do you want? Yeah, to And because it's adjustable and you can turn that however you want, the other thing, you'll see an image later where we're looking at doing waterfalls with a colorful background, right? Fall is mm -hmm. a great time because the water's flowing really fast if we've had a fair amount of rain in the fall. Um, right. And you've also got this beautiful color behind the waterfall or on the sides of it. Another thing to look for around waterfalls or around any rocks or creeks or what have you is wet leaves. Wet leaves look fantastic when they're fall, when they're mm -hmm. full of all of that fall color. Yeah. Um, but we use for the for the uh, waterfalls, we use neutral density filters. And something like this one here goes from a very little bit of darkness to extremely dark. And what does that mean? Why is that useful? Well, if you're trying to slow down that water to get that smooth ribbony look to it, a lot of people realize that this is what you need. And the more darkness you create, the slower you can have the shutter speed without blowing out all the details. So these are some of the filters and some of the gear that we'll use with fall foliage if we're working around water. And even mm -hmm. if you're not working around water, the polarizer is certainly very handy. Of course, if you're using some slower uh, shutter speeds, like we just said about the yeah. waterfalls, or even if it's just early morning and things are a little dark, you know, right. a good solid tripod. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, like, are you hauling a tripod with you when you go out there? So, yeah, yeah probably, sure. almost definitely. And, and of course, that helps with the macro stuff, right? Because oh, when sure. You're, yeah. When you, the closer you get to things, even with stabilization in the cameras and the lenses now that work very well, it's not always easy to get the sharpest picture. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sure about that, or if you question that, what I would say is take some shots with the stabilization and then try one or two with the tripod using that very well, maybe with a self timer or a release and compare the shots. And I think you'll see if you did that over time, the ones on the tripod are sharper. Some of the newer cameras allow you to go at such a fast shutter speed that you can do many frames a second. So it's a mm -hmm. little bit easier these days to not have to use a tripod, but for the kind of photography we're talking about here, it's, it's, it's often really helpful. It's often, yeah. Yeah. You know, the other thing, one more thing on the macro yeah. shot, um, when you looked at that that red leaf on the textured wood there, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. If you did happen to be in midday, the and we talk about these a lot for a lot of different kinds of photography, but the five-in-one reflector things, mm -hmm. one of the key things for that, and I have a bigger one here, the middle part of that is, is the diffuser. Okay. So when we have a light source and it's very, the sun's very bright, 
and our plant or whatever we're, we're looking at is, is down below that, we can have this, you can do our smaller ones than this too. We can have this in between and that's gonna give, bring out all of that color, but yet not have the highlights of that item, whatever it is, a mushroom, a flower, a leaf, not be blown out. So the mm -hmm. diffusion material, real simple tool that is almost invaluable for, if you can only get out in midday, go shoot some nice color, some macro stuff, put mm -hmm. a diffusion over it and nobody will ever know the difference. They'll think it was either a bright overcast or that you were in the shade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I, I, I think I've got three of them sitting right here in different <laughs> sizes. Yeah. Yep. yeah I, I carry a couple of different ones depending on what I'm shooting. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's take a look at something that combines a couple of the things that you were just talking about, I think. Yeah. When we're talking about, uh, we're getting a little bit beyond not just the lighting right now and not specifically the gear, but combining some things. This, we're now we're looking at getting really creative, okay? We're gonna show you some pictures that are a little bit different from the norm. I know a lot of people have tried some of these things. This isn't quite so unusual. You'll see a couple more unusual ones in a moment. But this is an example like with your red leaf photo and with your yellow leaf photo of finding a spot where the light wasn't harsh. We do mm -hmm. see there's a little bit of light coming in that we can see on the water and on the grass, but here it's a fairly balanced light. So it's easier for the camera to find a good exposure without blowing out the highlights or losing too much detail in the shadows. But the other thing we're doing here is, is getting very low. You know, when I saw this spot of color in the water, that in itself wasn't a picture, but that in combination with the grass around it seemed to say something. I just liked the the way that the, the color was was all in the reflection in the water. And yet we have these the beautiful slope of the grasses here that uh, that kind of frame mm -hmm. it on the right hand side. Yeah, and a polarizer was used for this. Oh, OK. Only so a little cutting bit. back that reflection. Only just a little bit so that there wasn't as much glare on the water with that. It gotcha. let the color through. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you polarize okay. too much, you know, you'll lose you'll lose a lot of that reflection. But sometimes just a tweak and it works fairly well. Right. Just being able to adjust it just that little bit. And then you got like I can clearly see the reflections of the ripples and a little bit of the waves. But it's not like glaring and overpowering mm -hmm. when you've got those those highlight reflections there. Yep. And because it was a relatively low light situation, uh, getting a tripod really low it was used. A, a tripod was used to get it. OK. Easier on my knees than trying to stay bent over. <laughs> Here's a shot from Steve's that, that gives you another angle. And a lot of people don't always think of this when you're out. But mm -hmm. if you find a beautiful colored tree, get right up close underneath it and see what it looks like on the canopy looking up. Oh, yeah. He's got a little bit of a gray or a white sky here, but it's less important than the fuller frame of all of that color. That's what my eye goes to. Yeah. Yeah. That and, red, it just fills the entire frame and wraps around the whole thing. Yeah. And then he's got that, that vine type part of it, you know, going kind of cascading around the corner, which leads the eye up into things. It's, mm -hmm. it's an interesting uh, composition. Yeah. Uh, oh, another yeah. technique, if you want to call <laughs> it is, not having to go into Photoshop or Lightroom, but using the things that your camera has already. So this was oh, an yeah. example from an Olympus camera. You know, a lot of the cameras have the art modes, right? Mm -hmm. Different different picture styles and things like that. This was an Olympus camera that has a number of different art modes, and this was just one of the more painterly ones. The scene as it was without it was okay, but look, mm -hmm. making it painterly like this, I don't know if that's coming across on the screens very well or not, but if you looked at it up close, you would see that there's a lot of more painterly kind of things going on there. So it's, it's just kind of fun and it's, it's done in an instant, you know, you're doing it in the camera. It doesn't yeah. require Photoshop skill. Um, it's just fun. It's fun to yeah. do. Yeah. And on something like a mirrorless camera, like the Olympus, it's a, what you see is what you get. You get to immediately see that in the viewfinder. Exactly. You know exactly what it's going to look like. Yeah. As you, when you put it into these art modes and you point that camera at something, you're seeing what it's going to look like, which is fantastic. You don't have to wait until after the shot. Mm -hmm. You know, it's cool that way. Yeah. This is another example of the same oh, thing. Yeah. From a distance, you know, it might look like a standard shot, but as you get up close, you realize that it's more of got a pastel kind of painterly kind of look. And again, that was an Olympus, Olympus mirrorless camera. 
with That's just neat. using one of the art filters. Yeah, it's that. very illustrative. It's almost a yep, almost like an illustration. very graphical sort of territory here. And instead of instead of just going for a mix of all colors, there's a focal point being mm -hmm. the yellow, the yellow flowers, of course. So yeah, when when you can in your f fall foliage or your fall color shots, try to lead the viewer to some specific subject within that color if you can. Mm -hmm. It's just a nice anchoring point for the eye, and, and we we tend to like those kind of things when we see them. Abstract yeah. is great, and sometimes that works fine, but sometimes you want to be thinking about what's what's the real focal point. Yeah. That's a little bit different, huh? <laughs> yeah. So Talk about lines leading you to the focal point. Yeah. <laughs> so this is definitely something where you'd want to have a tripod. You could do it without one, but it's much easier with, and you're going to get sharp... The parts of the image that will be sharp are going to be sharper when you're doing it on a tripod. There's also something a little special here in that this is a zoom lens that is on that has a collar on it, right? Because it's a little bit heavier. So instead okay. of mounting the camera to the tripod, you mount the foot of that collar. Oh. Well, the nice thing about that okay. is if you hold the camera, we're on a tripod, we're rock solid now, and you loosen that bracket. Mm -hmm. People do that all the time just to take a vertical picture and come very back quickly back to horizontal. But if you loosen that and you keep it fairly loose and during the exposure, like maybe a quarter second exposure or something like that, you turn the camera, it's turning yep. perfectly on that axis and you get stuff like this. And they're not so all successes. Is... Sure. I imagine there's going to be a lot of trial and error there. Yep. But that's so what we're looking at is not art filters not photoshop this is in camera in camera a single image just taking your 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 lens and rotating it uh, within its bracket and you do want to focus before you do it right you oh, don't sure. just want to just go up to something because yeah. you'd usually want something in focus and if you look the, the the berries are a little bit sharp and sometimes you just get a really cool spiral effect and you have to play around with the shutter speed you know, I mentioned mm -hmm. quarter of a second. These aren't like two second long things. It's usually an eighth of a second, a quarter of a second, mm -hmm. um, somewhere around there. So you have to get used to kind of doing that smoothly. And it's fun. I mean, it's just plain fun. Yeah, it looks like a lot of fun to play around with. And I never thought to just rotate the lens inside the collar yeah. like that before. And I mean, and if you don't have that, if you don't have a lens with a collar, certainly you can try this with your camera, you know, just yeah. turning it. It's yeah, just absolutely. a little harder to get it on that perfect axis. That's all. Mm-hmm. Yep. Let's talk about reflections. Uh, yeah. Another technique, something where you're very specifically looking for not just the scene in front of you, but how it reflects in the water. And when I saw this one of yours, I had to include this one, Scott. Tell us a little bit about this. I love this shot. All right. So I was taking some pictures for a friend of her family. And so we got the three kids out there. This is over at, um, at Lockridge. Ah, um, an October afternoon, the sun is going down, so it's lighting up and those trees are getting that it's kind of from the side and from the back. So this is an example of that, that backlighting where the leaves just light up when the light hits them and it was creating this great wash of color behind them. And then you get all that reflection. This is not a lake or a pond. This is just a large puddle. It hit, we had gotten a torrential rain. And so this area was kind of flooded. Um, but it wasn't more than like ankle deep. It's so terrific. It very still water and just this mirror reflection there. Speaking of the very still water, I'm glad you said that. Um, in a pond or, or in a puddle like that, as long as there aren't frogs jumping around disturbing it or something like that, you would expect it to be, if there's no wind, you know, fairly still like this. That's another reason why very early morning and late afternoon are best for fall foliage when you have water, because the, the water, even if there is a little bit of wind, is going to tend to be calmer. Mm -hmm. It's as we get through the day that the wind kicks up and those right, yeah. glass-like water surfaces are no longer there. You know, just a little bit of ripples is not going to give you quite as much of a good reflection, a good clean reflection. You'll see yeah. an example in a moment of a reflection where the water is rippling and you kind of take advantage of that. But if you want a really pristine, clear, crisp reflection like this, you either need to find a puddle that's still or get somewhere either very early in the day or very late in the day when there's no wind. Yeah. And that's, that ties into like 
Chris McGinnis, who was on talking about insect macro photography a couple of weeks ago, was saying something very similar when you're out mm -hmm. there. One, when you get out there early in the morning, the bugs aren't moving as fast because they're still cold. But exactly. two, the air is much more still. And yeah, so the, the air is, leaf that yep, they're the air is, on is much here. more still in the in the early mornings. And when you're looking at weather forecasts, you should be looking at that. You know, what's the wind? What's All right. On? Like what's my wind speed going to be for the day? Yeah. Before yeah. you get to the next one, let me speak to that a little bit. Sometimes if it's a very windy fall day, as we know, we do get wind, right? Mm -hmm. If it's a really windy fall day and you're looking to take pictures of leaves on trees, it might be hard to freeze the action, right? To get a fast enough shutter speed. So lean into that. Go the other way. If you've got a good, not a sapling, but if you've got a good sturdy tree and it's got some beautiful colored leaves and the wind is just blowing the heck oh, out of them. Yeah. Get on a tripod so that the, 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 the trunk will be still, but then intentionally use something like a neutral density filter to darken things up and let, get, let you get a slow shutter speed. Mm -hmm. And then take maybe a, a one or two second long shutter speed. And it will look like cotton candy, right? The oh, leaves yeah. moving will take this ethereal kind of look to them. And it's kind of fun to do. So another example of taking advantage of what you have, if it's mm -hmm. windy, there are ways to kind of play with that and get right. some, get some like show cool. that it was windy, show that right. motion. That's yeah. Right. Lean into it. Here's maybe a, a traditional kind of look at it to reflections. Mm -hmm. We've got a gray sky, not that exciting, but we have a lot of branches and some other color kind of filling up the frame. Yeah. The tree itself isn't in the frame at all. Sometimes just the reflection is what's fun and interesting. And that's what you're looking at here is mm -hmm. taking advantage of what you have in front of you. If it's not a great day sky wise, maybe mm -hmm. you can still find some interest in all of the vein like kind of lines going on with a little bit of color mixed in. So just another reflection example. Yeah. There's all this great texture and this veiny stuff going. So it's not upside down. It's this is the reflection. It's, it's the reflection, right? So if I wanted to play around with this further, would this be a good place to play around with the polarizer and maybe mix the reflection versus what's underneath? It would because sometimes you can take a little bit of that sky away right mm -hmm. by, by 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 the polarizer and you might see some rocks or something interesting underneath the water then so you can't see the water here at all because we're not polarizing mm -hmm. um really hardly anything here but if we put a little more polarizer on that we might actually see some detail within the water itself and sometimes you get this kind of multiple worlds kind of thing going on where it's the light from above and the reflection and you see something in the water it's it's kind of surreal looking sometimes i don't have an example of it here but that's a, no, but that's I can see point. like if there were like a lot of times when I'm looking at a small pond and there's there's already leaves lying there and they're under the water. Yep. And you could kind of combine those two. Yep. Good idea. Yeah. Good thinking. Good thinking. Oh, that's a neat Here, reflection. Here's another low angle shot in the same Back area the as that other one. Mm -hmm. But we're including more of the reflection here, right? We just looked at one where the reflection was everything. But here we're giving the viewer in the top part, at least some hint of what the actual image was and where that line is, where the reflection is going on. So I love what the, the ripples on the surface of the water do. It's almost like an impressionist painting, the way it all kind of. Yeah, kind of like a Monet kind of look and feel here. Yeah, it's and that's that's what's interesting about a lot of the modeled color that you get on the surface of water. And you don't always get a predominant red like this or a predominant yellow. So when you do, you know, work with it like mm -hmm. yellow with blue, like yellow reflections with blue sky. Those two colors work so well together. Yeah. Red and green in the right composition work pretty well together. That's why this worked for me. So lots of different stuff you can do out there. Creativity. Yeah. Fall is for creativity, I'd like to say. <laughs> Sky's the limit. So here's another reflection, but we have moving water. Mm -hmm. This is like a little rivulet. Uh, in a pool actually beneath a waterfall and the blue that you see in it, the little specks of blue is the sky reflected. So we do have, okay. A blue yeah. Sky. Mm -hmm. And the rest of it is, is mostly just the gold and amber leaves that are all around that are reflecting in the water, but you get this kind of rhythm kind of thing going on from top to bottom mm -hmm. because of the way the water was flowing. So if you don't have that pl Lake Placid or that placid kind of uh, <laughs> ice, look to the top of the water if things are moving again just go with it maybe yeah. use an eighth of a second 
and see how that goes and see if you can get something interesting. Right. This is motivation to carry your tripod with you. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Some of those slow shutter speeds are going to require it. Like, eh, do I really want to carry it? Yes. Yes, you do. Yeah, you do. It's <laughs> worth it. Even if you only use it a few times. Now, this one might be more recognizable as a surface of water. Mm -hmm. We've got some different colors going on here. We've got this kind of neat orange and red down the middle, kind of flanked by the green on the sides. At least to some degree, it's kind of a ribbony kind of thing. And so we've got moving water. We're going to try a slightly slower shutter speed. And you can either freeze the action or you can slow it down a little bit and see what you get. Yeah. And, and as I'm, you said before, trial and error, Scott, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to take a few shots before you get one that you might like. I'm really liking all the stuff that you've done with water in combination with the leaves and using that to reflect that color back at us. I'm starting to think about like, okay, in town here, there's a stream down there and then there's the canal over here and I got to find a spot. Here, here's, here's an important point along those lines. Sometimes you're not going to see this color until you get down low. Like, or you're not going to see your composition with the color in the water. Right. Yeah. And you really want to be looking down. You want to be getting down low and looking, you know, have fun with it. You know, this yeah. is a time of year when having a camera is just an open, an opening to a lot <laughs> of really fun stuff. Really fun yeah, stuff. Sure. A little different here, right? Mm hmm. So we're doing this again in the camera but we're not doing any rotations this way. And a lot of people have tried this, but those of you who haven't certainly try it. You want to do this on a tripod. You can try it without, but I promise you it works better most of the time with. We're taking a zoom lens and during the exposure, and maybe it's two thirds of a second, maybe it's a half a second, probably not longer than that, maybe even a quarter second, you're zooming the lens either in or out to get this kind of effect. And if you, know, you focus I, first, and if you do it yeah. smoothly, you can usually get some part of the image somewhat sharp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> somewhat sharp. Somewhat sharp. Because <laughs> you're moving, right? You're moving the yeah. lens. So. This is kind of the classic. We always see this done with like Christmas lights. Yeah. And yeah. I haven't seen it done a ton with fall color. Yep. It's, it's interesting really variation. Yeah. This, this particular image wasn't a really, what I'd call a robust color. It was okay. Mm -hmm. And this, the still image that I have without this is certainly not quite as interesting as this one is. Hey. So sometimes that'll punch things up and here's doing the same. Oh, thing. wow. Yeah. So we're on a trail and, you know, zooming in is going to give you one effect. Zooming out is going to give you another, just mm -hmm. concentrate on doing it smoothly. So you've got a, I, I like to have a remote shutter release instead of pressing the shutter because any, any shake is going to. Mm, yeah. Cause you're trying to do vibration. this and this so at the same time. I would yeah. be doing this with my right hand with a remote shutter release on a tripod and then zooming through um, with the left hand carefully. I have my hand on the lens ready to go instead of grabbing the lens. Cause that'll introduce vibration. So have your hand right. on, on the lens, try to be as still as you can shoot the shot and zoom it. Yeah, I imagine like that sounds a little awkward trying to do everything at once with both hands on the camera and then like your lines will wind up wobbly rather than Yeah, I get, exactly. Yep, you get you get a lot of wonky looking things. So, rock solid on a tripod, be ready on the zoom, know how far it is to turn it and have your remote shutter and you're good to go. All right. So, I think we got one more. There we go. And this kind of puts together a whole bunch of stuff that we talked about. It does. Uh, compositionally, Steve, uh, again, has created a, a really nice shot. The water leads you in and through the through the image. It kind of zigzags back. You've got this cool S-curve kind of thing going on. But he's taken advantage of the color in, uh, as part of his background. And mm -hmm. he's definitely using a neutral density filter and possibly a, um, a polarizer here to slow down that water without blowing out all the highlights. And he's got the interest of the texture in the rocks. And he's, he's almost certainly using a tripod. Oh, yeah. And he's gotten down low, so at least to some degree. So he's got this interesting perspective. The waterfall looks a little more majestic that way rather than if you're up above it looking down at it. 
So a lot of different things coming together here, both gear wise and technique wise, knowing that a slower shutter speed is going to give you that ribbony water using the tripod to keep things steady, using the filters. Mm -hmm. So it all kind of comes together here. There's a lot of different techniques to get a good waterfall picture, especially with the, uh, with the foliage in the background. The fall color back there. Yeah. yeah. So good stuff. Yeah. Very good stuff. All right. Well, I think that's about where we're going to wrap it up. So thank you once again for joining us for the Wednesday night photo show. Thank you, Phil, for some spectacular images and some inspiration to go out and take some pictures, even though it's going to be kind of gray out. Now we got some ideas for, okay, what other kind of shots can I get out there? Terrific. There's some colors starting to appear out there. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Really All right. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. We are going to be off next time. We're taking our trip to Lakota Wolf Preserve. So we will not be around in two weeks, but two weeks after that, we'll be back for another episode of the photo show. We hope to see you then. Night, everybody. Oh, you're welcome, Kid Dito. Thanks for joining us. Always good to see you.